Hey everyone, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Art, and in this episode of This Week in Architecture, we're going to be discussing a paper from ISCA 2014, and it's called Flipping Bits in Memory Without Accessing Them, an Experimental Study of DRAM Disturbance Errors. And we're going to be going over a presentation that I found um, from a class at University of Michigan. Uh, so you may already be f familiar with this paper in some sense, because this was really the paper that introduced this idea of uh, row hammer attacks. Right, and so we'll, we'll get more into what that means uh, right now. Right, so this is uh, from um, owner Mutlu's group um, while he was at uh, CMU. So kind of the motivation behind this is, you know, it's all about technology scaling. So, you know, as we make, you know, DRM smaller and smaller, we get some benefits, right? So it's smaller, so we get more density, right? So it also is gonna become cheaper, right? But there's some problems with reliability here. All right, so you see a couple right here. So smaller cell will hold um, less charge, right? Once the, uh, the cells get really, really close together, there's electromagnetic coupling. And then of course, you know, it's really, really hard to manufacture things uh, that are really, really small, right? So you, know, you get some variation in the actual um, process technology, right? So it's not a perfect process. So you're gonna get some more uh, defects, right? So why is this important? Well. If you know something's wrong with the hardware, right? This can lead to bugs in terms of memory isolation. So, one of the big guarantees that we have with memory is that you know if somebody tries to read something that doesn't belong to them, they're not allowed to do that. But if there's an actual problem in the hardware, right? So we're talking about a hardware bug here, not a software bug, right? This can have some unintended side effects. So all of a sudden we can start you know messing with data that we're not actually accessing at that point. We're we're modifying data that's near what we're accessing. So. Let's go ahead and first do a brief, brief, uh, brief uh, overview of DRAM, kind of the basics of how this works. So, you know, of course, things in you know memory are stored as ones and zeros, right? And we have this, uh, we access these transistors used to read, write uh, data to a specific cell. So here you, we've got these rows, we have these individual memory cells, and we have these row buffers. And each of these cells is going to be, you know, represented here transistor and a capacitor. And then we have this bit line right here. So when we're trying to access some of these bits, right? So the first thing we have to do is we've got to raise a word line. So we'll go ahead and activate, right? This entire row. Then uh, after it's activated, we can start doing these reads, right? So we can read out from each of these columns uh, into a row buffer, right? And then eventually when we're done, we can go ahead and uh, close the word line, right? So. Um, that's this process right here. So that, that's kind of the basics of reads and writes uh, in terms of DRAM, right? In kind of a simplified fashion. But, you know, it, these things aren't perfect, right? So we'd like to think that, okay, well, when we're not reading anything out, well, you know, we'll have those capacitors, right? Those transistors, they'll hold, you know, that one or zero forever, right? But that's not quite how it works in reality. So things leak, right? Capacitors leak. So eventually things will happen, like, you know, to combat this, so th these will eventually be refreshed, right? Before they drop below a certain point, we'll have to refresh a row. But um, that's how we prevent things like data loss here, right? And that's what this uh, periodic refresh is, right? And so DRAM specifications guarantee a retention time before a cell loses this data, right? So, um, but what's the problem here, right? So uh, what happens if, you know, we don't refresh and then there's some, you know, problem. Well, we already said that the DRM manufacturers, uh, you know, guarantee you know, how long these things will go before they, you know, they lose, you know, enough to actually cause some kind of data loss. But it turns out, right, that we can cause disturbance errors by accessing these, uh, these rows, right, these word lines. So it turns out that once we start accessing you know, these word lines over and over and over, say the same one, this has an unintended side effect on the neighboring word lines. And this causes them to actually leak that charge faster than they normally would. So the main idea behind this is that if we repeatedly ta uh, target, right? So in this case, we've got this aggressor row, the adjacent rows, you know, physically in memory, uh, this will end up causing these to cause an error, right? Uh, so, you know, maybe we'll flip bits here or here, we'll cause these bits to flip, right, without actually accessing them, right? So, you know, this is you know, kind of the, uh, the the main idea of the paper. So, you know, 
we repeatedly, so what they did was they basically showed that you could repeatedly uh, read data from the same row in DRAM and track bit flips in the other rows, right? So, you know, they flush the cache line after each read, right? And then, you know, further experimental setup, they use this, uh, this, this really cool big setup, right? Tons of FPGAs, right? So uh, eight Xilinx FPGA boards, a bunch of uh, DDR3, 800 memory controllers. They've got a heater in here, right? So when we're talking about, you know, things that are happening in a physical environment, you want to see, okay, well, how does this change, you know, different circumstances? So if I heat things up, you know, that's going to have a different, you know, all of a sudden the transistors will be operating slightly differently, right? Once things warm up. So you want to see, you know, does this only happen when we really push these devices to the edges, right? So when we heat things up a lot, or does it happen just normal working conditions? And so they test, you know, 129 different, you know, DRAM modules, right? And this corresponds to about to 972 DRAM chips, right? And they test across, like I said, a range of things. So the activation interval, the refresh interval, and then uh, the actual data pattern. So one, they want to toggle all the lines in module repeatedly and locate all disturbed cells. So quickly identify all disturbed cells uh, throughout the entire module. And then the second thing is toggle a single row repeatedly and identify specific disturbed cells. Right, so you want to correlate victim cells with aggressor rows. So you want to see, okay, if I keep accessing this one row over and over and over, who am I actually uh, you know, causing to have errors? So here we see, you know, in the 19 oldest modules, you know, so here you see, you know, in the oldest ones down here, um, there's actually not, you know, there's no problems here. So they actually didn't, so this is errors per 10 to the 9 cells. So you see that it's actually zero for a lot of these, right? And that kind of makes sense. We said that this was a problem with scaling, right? So we said that once we make transistors smaller, we get all these unintended side effects. So while the transistors were, you know, pretty big, right, or at least relatively big, we didn't actually see these, you know, disturbance errors, right? With these coupling effects weren't quite as bad the process technology you know maybe by this point it was mature enough where that wasn't really a problem um and so it's th this is one of those things that's you know relatively recent so again this paper is from 2014 so the paper itself is you know pretty old at this point but you see it was only getting you know worse and worse and worse you know as uh, time progressed because we're still making transistors smaller Right, so um, this is something that's been, you know, this was kind of the kind of the first landmark paper on the subject, but there's been many, many sub uh, papers on this subject since then. So again, you know, they wanted, they looked at access patterns. So they see, you know, do we get disturbance errors? You know, when we do open, read, close, and we do that sequence of three steps, you know, in times. Open, write, close, we do that sequence in times. Open, read, and we do that read to the in times, close and then open right uh, to the end times close. So what they're really showing here is that it's, you know, the, the key thing that's causing these errors is activating that word line. So when we open, read um, to the end and then close, right, um, we're not going to be, you know, constantly, or when we're doing all of these reads, right, and we're not, you know, opening and closing that word line, um, this isn't causing those disturbance errors, right? So it's really the, the the process of, you know, opening and closing that's causing this. So those are remain constant between these. And we see that, you know, it's only in these first two that we actually see disturbance errors. So clearly it's a problem with um, the word line toggling. And so here we see the refresh intervals, right? So clearly, you know, if your interval that you're actually doing refreshing, is a lot faster, right? So if you're refreshing very quickly, you're not going to see many disturbance errors because there's not enough time for all the, the charge to leak out. But as you make these intervals longer and longer, you'll see, of course, more and more errors. Then, of course, you see that the uh, activation intervals, right? So if you make the intervals where you actually do the activation, you know, of that word line, you know, faster and faster and faster, you start to see more errors. And then, of course, with the, uh, they looked at data pattern, so, um, victim cells lose charge when they're disturbed. So true's high voltage one, anti-cell high voltage zero. True is dominant, error is mostly one to zero. So it's mostly that leakage of charge from one to zero. So, you know, the one of the also interesting points is that, you know, we're accessing this word line over and over and over, but that actually doesn't cause any errors to that line. So what we're actually reading doesn't end up seeing the errors. It's only an effect on the neighboring ones.
right? So strong peaks at plus or minus one, which means immediately adjacent cells are the most at risk. But, you know, that's still not, you know, necessarily to say that, you know, non-adjacent rows won't also face effects, right? And so they showed that this was, you know, you know, pretty repeatable, right? So, or actually very repeatable. Um, so they did this across a bunch of uh, iterations. They looked at, um, so another key thing is, you know, victim cells is not equal to weak cells. So weak cells are the cells with the shortest retention time. And, but, and they also showed that, you know, if you, you know, change the temperature, so they sw swung the temperature from plus or, uh, plus or minus 20 C, right? Um, that didn't, uh, that from ambient temperature, that actually didn't cause much of an effect. So this isn't just something at the very fringe of execution. Right, so, you know, after closing a row, memory controller might refresh one of the adjacent rows by probability P, small constant. So this is a stateless solution, right? So this, they, they went into some of the other, you know, ways you could fix this, right? So, um, you know, this helps, right? So this is basically saying, okay, well, let's refresh the rows across something that was just asked, uh, accessed or, you know, near something that was just accessed. But, you know, what we want is certainty that we're not going to lose data, right? We don't want to, you know, a high probability. We, we like some certainty. So, you know, the main, you know, kind of key point with this paper is they showed that this wasn't just, you know, some kind of one-off problem. They showed that it was pervasive across a lot of the chips that they saw, right? So, uh, I think they show it, you know, maybe at the end. Um, but basically, I think it was maybe 120 of the 129 modules or even higher than that, which corresponds to something like 800 and something different chips all showed those DRAM uh, disturbance errors, right? And they were reproducible. And of course, you know, they, they went over a number of solutions. So make better chips, of course, <laughs> correct errors, refresh all rows frequently, right? So a lot of these, a lot of these different things and, you know, some of these have even been, you know, proposed solutions, you know, fairly recently. I remember reading a paper, um, I think it was from David Winsloff uh, at Princeton, that was basically, uh, you know, these tree-based counters to figure out, you know, which rows are most likely to need refreshing. So you don't have to track the access of every single row in memory. You can kind of allocate these counters to, you know, have less counters in memory uh, in order to fix uh, figure out which ones you should actually be refreshing. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this video. So this was a um, you know, brief overview of, let's go ahead and open it back up, uh, flipping bits in memory without accessing them, an experimental study of DRAM disturbance errors. I'll go ahead and link the paper below as well and link to that presentation. But that's going to do it for today. You know, Here's the GitHub page where I post all the code for all the other series, um, including the presentations and links to the papers for this series. So we've got stuff on C++, GPU programming, etc. But that's going to do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.